who the peasants are, and is it possible that the peasants would show up in the records of even the most sophisticated medieval people? If not, then all we can get from the peasants are the kind of shadowy hints uh, that we've talked about before, sometimes from subsequent centuries. Uh, or we could see the peasants through the imitations of the nobles, or once in a while we can see the peasants through their crimes, as when they have a festival of fools uh, and they, make, uh, they mock a certain church member. Or sometimes the peasants are so interested in having their holiday rites uh, for example, peasants were supposed to get free food at noble weddings, okay? And we have a record from medieval France of uh, peasants denied free food who went ahead and killed their lord on that particular day. Uh, peasants did have some sort of holiday rights and special privileges. But is this all we see of the peasants? Uh, and I think it's a question that's really uh, worth asking, one that we have to examine in some detail. Uh, a number of historians from the 20th century consider the peasants to have been a different species altogether. Uh, and if we go back to Middle Ages, indeed, we'll find a lot of the philosophers and a lot of the historians of the Middle Ages, a lot of the chroniclers talk about the peasants as if they're almost beasts, as if they're not really uh, like people, or as if there's a, a really uh, unbridgeable chasm between the peasant and the noble. Um, this is true, uh, but it is also true, I believe, according uh, to the formulation of one of the most famous of the 19th century French historians, a man named J.J. Jusserand, okay, uh, who has a very famous proverbial statement that I love to quote. He says, if the distinctions between class and class were more pronounced in the Middle Ages than they are now, so was the familiarity. One reason why the upper classes went out of their way to make sure that they weren't imitated by the peasants uh, is that they lived in such close proximity to the peasants that they wanted to make sure everyone could tell the difference. Uh, no question that the Middle Ages was a very class conscious time. In the 14th century, for example, in England, there were laws enacted decreeing what each class could wear. A sumptuary legislation which determined uh, what a a noble could wear, and what a merchant could wear, what a lower class person could wear. So there's a lot of consciousness of class difference. But the point that I'm trying to stress here is a lot of this attempt to differentiate class from class, a lot of the attempt for a noble to call a peasant an animal, a lot of the attempt to treat a peasant like an animal comes out of the fact that the nobles are indeed familiar with the peasants and they want everybody to know what the difference is. Uh, there are certain uh, surviving records which make it pretty clear that the nobles put the peasants sometimes close to beasts. Uh, for example, uh, it's dictated in certain uh, religious records uh, or records from religious houses that noble people wear, uh, I'm sorry, noble people eat wheat bread, white wheat bread, okay? You still have the reference to uh, white bread society or the white bread world, uh, which we find even in the late 20th century indicating upper class people. The peasants were supposed to eat the rye, the sort of rough dark bread. That was their daily lot. And the horses and other farm animals would eat oats. Well, we're told in times of famine that the upper classes will eat the wheat and the rye, and the peasants and the horses will eat the oats. Okay, So we do have these, these uh, kinds of uh, customary statements uh, uh, that indicate that the peasants are thought of as very, very low. And yet, we find these records from some of the richest and most highly placed people in the Middle Ages that indicate that they know very clearly what the peasants are living like. Uh, for example, Chaucer has a very famous poem called The Canterbury Tales, where he presents us a knight and a prioress and very well-off people, but he also presents us a miller and a plowman and some others as well. Uh, he mentions some things uh, that uh, it seems, or at least seemed to people for a long time, must have been made up things, sort of cartoon images of what a peasant is like. Uh, for example, he states that the miller, the sort of rough guy who had the job of grinding the grain of the peasants, the miller could break a door by running at it with his head, or heave it off his hinges by running at it, and just 
uses his, sort of a primitive karate, a karate for people with small brains, okay? Uh, and this was assumed to be a joke for a long time, but then uh, in the 20th century, people started doing research into peasant fairs, and it was found that there were still surviving traditions among the peasantry of having contests at the local fairs of breaking doors with one's head. Uh, and you can trace this tradition back quite some time. Chaucer seems to have known something about the play life of the peasants that isn't preserved in other written records. Okay? Uh, Chaucer also mentions other traditions that are preserved in writing, but probably in sources that he couldn't go to. Uh, for example, he talks in the Wife of Bath's prologue. Wife of Bath is a pretty testy character who has five husbands, and she doesn't get along that well with any of them for one reason or another. And she says at one point, the bacon was not fetched for me that is found, uh, that is given to certain couples at Dunmo. Okay, in the town of Dunmo. Okay, we have a tradition of the Dunmo flitch, or this side of bacon. And we know from at least the 13th century forward in the village of Dunmo that after a year's time, if there is a couple in the village that has made it through the year without fighting, they're given a slab of bacon. So Chaucer is referring to this tradition. And he's having the wife of Bath say, well, I'll never win this, and none of my husbands uh, could help me win this either. Okay? And he's referring to it in such a way that we can assume that his audience, and his audience would include King Richard II and John of Gaunt, and some of the most powerful people in 14th century England, that they also knew about this tradition. Uh, so the evidence that we have, sometimes spotty as it is, is that there's a great deal of continuity in knowledge between the peasants and the noble people. It may be true. Uh, that uh, there are huge class distinctions and that the nobles often call the peasants animals, but there does seem to be a basic knowledge of what the peasants do with their life all the time. Um, uh, one thing that I'm fond of pointing out to my classes is that all the evidence seems to indicate that the average noble in Chaucer's time knew a great deal more about the peasants than the average college professor of today knows about life in urban ghettos. You know, we live in a society where presumably information of all kinds is open to us, uh, but the knowledge that one class had of another class in medieval England is far greater than most of our knowledge about other classes. And even sometimes if we're specialists in studying them, we don't have the direct hands-on experience with rural life and the life of the peasantry that uh, these individuals had in Chaucer's time. Okay. Um, so I, I think th those are important, uh, in, important points to work out. And there must have been, as well, certain times and certain places where the nobility and the peasantry came together, at least symbolically. In Chaucer's poem, The Canterbury Tales, again, we're given a, a big spectrum of medieval life, from knights all the way down to plowmen. And a number of writers in the 19th and the 20th century have asked, well, is it really possible that such a group of people could have come together on a pilgrimage, that the high and the low really have, could have gotten together? Or is this kind of a fiction that Chaucer is creating? Um, I think it's a very good question, and one that we ought to examine by looking closely at what sort of evidence we have. And what, one very important place to look for evidence on what pilgrims might have been like would be to look at Canterbury Cathedral, that very famous a uh, place which is the goal of the pilgrims in the poem of the Canterbury Tales. Uh, they're all on their way to this place where Thomas a Becket is martyred. Um, and one thing that I found very interesting about uh, this particular uh, cathedral and, and the uh, particular uh, series of events surrounding the life and death and uh, cults of Thomas Becket is that it seems to bring all the classes together uh, in some very interesting ways. Um, the, uh, let's see, monitor here is revealing an image from uh, the uh, roof of Exeter Cathedral showing Thomas a Becket being murdered in the cathedral uh, uh, by four Norman knights who were sent by Henry II. Uh, you may not remember this story. It may not have been told to you as part of your class here. So I thought I'd just go over the details. Chaucer writes his poem in the 14th century but he is writing about a pilgrimage to Canterbury to commemorate a saint, the most 
popular English saint of his time. And this saint lived in the 12th century, and he was martyred in the 12th century. Uh, the story is uh, one of those uh, great stories of the Middle Ages that's been retold as a film, Beckett starring Richard Burton, rewritten as a play by T.S. Eliot, known as Murder in the Cathedral, rewritten as a play by the Frenchman Jean Anouy, uh, and called Beckett or the Honor of God. And it focuses upon this very interesting relationship of power between a king, Henry II, uh, and his archbishop friend. Okay? Henry II promoted Arch, uh, promoted uh, a, the son of a London merchant, Thomas Becket, to become Chancellor of England, the highest non-noble political position in England. Okay? And uh, Thomas Becket then was doing the king's work for him. And the king's work often found itself to be in conflict with the work of the church. Okay? The church and the state had many turf battles. Uh, and when a certain Archbishop of Canterbury died, the Archbishop of Canterbury being the most important, uh, the highest uh, position of the church in England, Henry II thought, I'll have it made if I can have Thomas Becket, my loyal friend and chancellor, also made Archbishop of Canterbury, and that way I'll be in control of both the secular world and the religious world. There'll be no end to my power. Okay? Uh, so indeed, he has Thomas uh, Becket uh, made a bishop, uh, and made an archbishop, actually given religious orders uh, the day before he becomes an archbishop. This is a man who clearly has no religious background, or the very smallest amount of religious background. It's quite clearly a trumped up case to get his own political man into this religious office that Harry, uh, that uh, Henry II is pursuing here. Uh, and yet, once Thomas Becket becomes archbishop, he decides he's going to work for the church. And he starts siding with the church and with the pope and with the small-time priests against Henry II in terms of jurisdiction, in terms of, of turf wars. This makes Henry II very angry. Uh, and then we have the tradition that Henry II one day uh, is stating, uh, who will rid me of this troublesome priest? And there are four Norman knights, four pals of Henry II, who take Henry II at his word, and they go off, and they kill Thomas Becket as he's in Canterbury Cathedral. Okay? Now, you can imagine a bishop killed by a king, a bishop for asserting the rights of the clergy against the king, is going to become quite a hero to the church. Uh, and it's not surprising then that the pope, who often has an axe to grind with Henry II, is going to make sure that this man becomes a saint. So Thomas Becket becomes a saint in almost record time. Within two years and two months, he's named a saint. Within two years and two times of his death, uh, which is pretty close to a record for the church. Meanwhile, anyone who talks back to the king might as well be a hero to the folk, the peasants as well. We have traditions that Thomas Becket's blood wasn't yet dry before people were dipping their handkerchiefs in this blood and there were supposed to be miracles performed. Of course, here the church and the peasants are going to work together to some extent against the nobility uh, to make sure uh, that their man, Thomas the Becket, got all kinds of recognition. Um, when we go to Canterbury Cathedral, which is one of the most important monuments to Christianity in all of England, it is the seat of the Archbishop of Canterbury. It's still the place where the highest uh, religious official in England is to be found even if that person is now an Anglican as opposed to a Catholic, okay? uh, we find around the tomb of Becket all kinds of marks of nobility. We f see, for example, stained glass images that uh, tell us about uh, the archbishop uh, and tell us about kings. Um, and I'm going to show you some of that stained glass right now. I'm going to show one of them to you a little bit out of order now because of the way that the slides are set up here. Uh, there is a little facsimile I have of a bit of stained glass here to give you some idea of the kinds of images uh, that you, you find in uh, Canterbury Cathedral. It's a very large place. And in much of Canterbury Cathedral, you see windows that tell the stories from the Bible. Elsewhere, you see whole collections of the lives and figures of kings uh, and saints who are particularly important to English tradition. But there is an area where Becket's tomb is found, this miracle-making tomb. And all around the tomb uh, is a series of windows known as the miracle windows. And they are there to depict the miracles uh, that Thomas Becket presumably 
performed when people of various sorts prayed to him. Uh, and the question might still be moot as to whether uh, a knight and a plowman would go into the church together. Uh, but if you look at the windows, the miracle windows that surround the shrine of Thomas of Becket, you will see that the nobles and the peasants are all there uh, together in these various windows, all kind of testimony uh, to the importance of this man. And all part, of, I think, of a, a, a church program to show that Thomas is the only person who's elevated above us. Uh, the world's divided into two classes according to the uh, miracle windows, Thomas of Becket and everybody else. Uh, and some of the uh, images that you see there are really very homely scenes. Uh, here you see a scene uh, from one of the windows celebrating the life of a little fellow named Rod Virtulus. Okay? Uh, and this fellow was just among a group of people who were stoning frogs. Uh, and as they were throwing rocks at the frogs in this little river, Rod Virtulus, or little Robert, fell into the water and presumably drowned. Here you see an image of a couple of kids who are coming up to the parents of Rod Virtulus and telling them what's happened to their son. Uh, and what you see here, I think, is a confrontation uh, and a, a moment of panic uh, shared by kids and parents. And what is noticeable about this depiction and noticeable about most of these miracle windows is that simply by looking at these individuals, you can't tell if they're peasants or, or nobles. In many churches and elsewhere, even Canterbury Cathedral, there's very clear depictions of class, and people are depicted by occupation and rank. But when you look at these people who are the subject of the miracles, uh, uh, all of them tend to look very much alike, uh, whether they're noble or not. Now, these particular stories uh, were uh, collected, actually, after Thomas Beckett died. And for between 10 years and 20 years after his death, there were a couple of monks at Canterbury Cathedral, one named William and one named Menedek, who just went around and collected the stories of Thomas's miracles. And they're all written down in these books, volumes and volumes of miracles. Again, one of the very interesting things about uh, the miracles themselves is they involve both the high and the low. And apparently, the monks are listening to everybody and getting the stories from everybody so that all the classes are represented more or less uh, impartially. Uh, when these stories are placed into the windows, uh, very few of the stories have captions that mention names at all. And even sometimes when you can tell in the written story that there, there is a noble who's involved in the story, when the story appears in picture form on the windows, and where it's telling a story for those who can read and for those who can't read as well, the class markers disintegrate completely. Uh, and we could be cynical and talk about this as a massive and clever plea to get big donations from everybody, whether they're rich or poor. Uh, but we could also talk about this as one place in England where we seem to see all the classes come together, more or less impartially. Uh, one of the most interesting things I found last uh, fall when I was uh, in Canterbury and looking at the windows in Canterbury Cathedral is that over the years, we have sort of gentrified the miracle windows. We have added certain kind of images. For example, the image of King Louis VII of France having a dream that told him to come to Becket's shrine uh, to seek cures for his family. Okay? Uh, we, we have scenes like this that are in the windows now. Okay? And we see the Middle Ages, you might say, through a noble filter. We have other scenes that are found in the cathedral now that depict knights in battles. And they're quite clearly knights. But what has been revealed in the last few decades by people who are doing archaeological reconstruction on the glass is that every single one of these noble images is post-medieval. These are all images that were made in the 18th and 19th century to replace broken glass. And we have no evidence at all that there was any story of a noble besides perhaps Henry II himself, who was the king involved in Becket's life that was depicted in this entire place. It's interesting that we, in later years, have wanted to make the Middle Ages more noble than it seems to have been. That we're the ones who seem to be so much more interested in kings and knights. The actual medieval cathedral seems to have recognized peasants more than we do. Uh, and that's a, a point I think we should consider continually um, in looking uh, at the stories uh, that stained glass can uh, show us. One thing I'm going to do now is show you some slides of uh, images from the cathedral. Uh, some, uh, and uh, these will give you some idea of the sorts of stories that are told there. <laughs> 
The first of these slides uh, is an image of Thomas Beckett himself. He goes a little bit off the picture there. Uh, and actually, this depiction of Beckett uh, and uh, the following depictions of Beckett uh, and uh, King Henry, and there you see King Henry on the right with his hands raised, who's apparently at this point doing penance at Beckett's tomb for having caused the death of Beckett. This is a new window. This is new within the last century or two. It's part of our story of things. Now, King Henry may have been there originally, but we found that when most of the, um, uh, the, the people went around and broke the cathedral glass after Henry VIII uh, uh, tried to get rid of the cult of saints, they destroyed all the images of saints but left the images of kings. Their only reason for destroying an image of Henry II is they wouldn't want to show the image of a king doing obeisance to a saint. Because Henry VIII came along and he said, we're pulling out of the Catholic Church. We don't believe in the Catholic Church. We don't believe in the saints anymore. And the whole idea of a king who would prostrate himself before a saint was just too much to take. Now, it's possible then that we do have an image of, of Henry II from the earlier times. Uh, but there's absolutely no evidence to support that right now. We cannot prove that there was a single noble depicted on the older windows. Here we see again from one of these new windows, a 19th century window, uh, Beckett on the right, and King Henry II on the left, uh, from better days when they talked to each other uh, before Beckett was killed uh, at the hands of Henry's men. Uh, OK, but when we go back and look at the real windows, and these windows survive from the 13th century, the very old glass, what we get is a mixed bag of stories. Here we have a man named Richard Suneviev, who's lying down at the left of your picture. He's asleep on his, uh, with his head resting on his hand. Uh, this is a story of a man who was supposed to mind his lord's horses. Uh, and he fell asleep while uh, assigned to this task, and he wakes up with leprosy. Okay? Uh, an indication here, part of a message, you better serve your master well. Okay, this is uh, uh, a pretty strong uh, class ideal here. If you're a servant, you better be a good one. Well, he becomes a leopard, and here we see someone, presumably his mother, who's trying to feed him, and she's trying to protect herself from leprosy with a scarf that's covering her mouth. It's assumed that leprosy is contagious in the Middle Ages. We now know, uh, uh, we know now, we know now that only certain brands of leprosy are contagious, uh, but in the Middle Ages, all were assumed to be. Well, Richard prays to St. Thomas Becket, and in return, he's completely cured. And the last panel that depicts the story of Richard Suneviev shows him and his mother on the left. And he's being greeted by his lord and master on the right. And then behind the lord is the lord's wife. Uh, and you see the lord there putting his hand on Richard's cheek, showing, you know, uh, that the man has been cured of his skin disease. Notice how similar these people look. You cannot distinguish them by dress. We don't have a noble here and a, a peasant. We have people who look very much alike. The story as it comes to us in the glass is really pretty much a story of equals. And sometimes, even though we have in the story the message that you better be a good servant, we also have uh, uh, other stories that show the poorer people and the weaker people punishing the rich who fail to, uh, to do homage to uh, Thomas Beckett. So the next image here, whoop, are we out of images? Um, Uh-oh, OK, well, apparently I didn't bring all the slides. Let me just tell you a little story then uh, that has to do with one of the most famous series of windows uh, in the uh, uh, Canterbury Cathedral among the miracle windows. This has to do with Sir Jordan Fitzisolf. And we know that, indeed, he was a nobleman. But when he's depicted in the glass, he doesn't look noble. He could as well be a businessman or, or anyone else. We know only from the biography that he actually knew Beckett, only from these earlier written records, uh, that there is uh, a nobleman here. Uh, this man had a plague that visited his house. Uh, and his nurse died, and members of his family uh, felt quite ill. Then at one point, uh, it looks like his son is going to die. And Jordan Fitz eyes off praise to his old friend, Thomas Beckett, and asked Beckett to restore this boy to health. He says, if you restore this boy to health, I will make many offerings at your tomb. So the boy is restored to health, and Sir Jordan is just ecstatic about the whole thing. Uh, and he's so happy that he forgets to, uh, to uh, uh, make his gift, his offering, to Thomas Beckett, his repayment, in essence, for the cure of the boy. 
Um, so time passes, and uh, the forgetfulness continues. And at this point, Thomas Becket himself, the saint, wearing his bishop's mitre and also carrying a sword in his hand, goes to visit the house of Gimp, who is a lame beggar, okay, a blind beggar, a blind lame beggar, I believe, if I remember correctly. Uh, do we have these images here now? Did this, somehow these things show up? Huh? How did that happen? Okay, let me look back here. Um, let's look at these things. Okay, so um, okay, uh, here we uh, here we have Thomas Becket going to Gimp, the beggar there. Okay, uh, and he tells Gimp to go to Sir Jordan and to tell Sir Jordan that he better pay up or a plague will visit the household. Well, the beggar then goes ahead and he does this. But Sir Jordan doesn't pay attention. He's not going to pay attention to a beggar. So what does Thomas Beckett go uh, and do? The next thing he does uh, is show up. You see him flying there in the air uh, at the top of the picture with his sword bared. Uh, he comes along and he kills Sir Jordan's son. Okay. At this point, Sir Jordan decides uh, that he'd better... I'll pay homage to Beckett, so he goes off and he makes his offering. Okay. Well, we can see a, a pretty uh, dangerous world there, a, a world where you better do what you're told, a world which isn't entirely fair by any means. But I think what's most interesting about this world is that it depicts sometimes peasants in position of great power. All the evidence we have from the Canterbury uh, pilgrimage, from the stories that are told, and the images on the windows, uh, indicates that in, indeed knights and peasants could be there at the same time, they could worship together, that they were in a certain place where Becket was more important than they were, but they were all supposed to be uh, in it together in some ways. They were the same species, they kept each other company, they told each other stories, and indeed the stories of their experiences, whether separate or, or mutual, are preserved there on the glass still today for all of us to see. Uh, with that in mind, I think it's important to note uh, that the Middle Ages has many folk tales that have been passed down to us, and these stories were popular with all classes. Uh, we find some nobles telling stories, and similar plots are also well known to peasants. Uh, and in looking at these various stories, we can learn quite a bit about the world view of the Middle Ages and about uh, the way that uh, the, uh, this particular world view uh, changed over time. Um, uh, for example, if we go back to what we talked about uh, in the first half and remember that folklore can be very conservative in form uh, and in content, but very dynamic in meaning and function, and what it actually does, uh, and apply that to folk tales, uh, we can uh, use folk tales as the basis of some pretty interesting experiments. Uh, for example, um, there uh, is a story. Uh, that we first find in England around 1300 uh, that I've still heard versions of in America in the 20th century. Uh, you can still recognize the similarity of these stories, but these stories change little by little, each time changing to reflect the values of the teller and the audience. So that by comparing these two very similar things and focusing on where the differences are, we can learn something about the difference between, say, medieval worldviews and our own worldviews. This particular story, which is found in a Latin sermon from around 1300, talks about a woman from Oxfordshire, uh, near, near the university town of Oxford. Uh, and it's said that she spends lots of time making her hair look good. Okay, uh, And she spends so much time putting herself up that she arrives at church later and later every week. And finally, she's gone through this elaborate ritual, piling her hair up so high and fixing it in place, that she arrives in church after the mass is over. And as she walks through the door and the rest of the congregation is about to leave, the devil, in the form of a spider, descends on her hair. And it won't get out of her hair. So she's writhing around you know, with this devil spider in her hair, uh, and it won't leave until the prayers of the monks are administered, they pray for her, and then the devil spider leaves. Okay. What do you suppose is the moral of this story? Vanity is no good. Okay, vanity will get you in trouble. Vanity is one sure 
uh, road to hell. Indeed, vanity is one of the seven deadly sins, according to the medieval uh, worldview. Um, and that's very easy for us to determine because a lot of these sermons use this particular story to illustrate the concept of vanity. You pay too much attention to yourself and you endanger your beautiful immortal soul uh, and you've made the wrong value judgments. Uh, okay, the version I heard in the 20th century, I think you'll recognize in terms of continuity, but it's dramatically different in certain ways. Uh, where I heard this told in Missouri, uh, we were living in sort of a two-class neighborhood. Uh, there was my group of people that considered itself to be the good guys, okay? Uh, and then there was, the story was told about the other people uh, who were designated as bikers uh, or as greasers in this particular neighborhood, reference to motorcycle gang people, okay? And the story goes that there is this young a uh, woman in high school who's got this beehive hairdo, okay? Uh, and uh, she spends hours and hours putting hairspray on this thing to hold it in place, and she doesn't wash. Uh, she sits in the back of the classroom, uh, and while other people are studying, she sort of leans against the back wall and drums her long painted fingernails on the, uh, uh, on the desk and whistles to herself and kind of sneers at the people who are doing their work and listening to the teacher, kind of laughs at them. Okay, uh, and uh, as she does this day after day, and as she comes in with her leather jacket and with her fancy beehive hairdo, um, uh, people are paying more and more attention to her. Um, uh, she sort of uh, becomes this, this folk figure, or sort of a negative, uh, uh, sort of an anti-teacher at the back of the, uh, the room. Uh, and then one day she just falls over. Uh, and the way I remember this story told to me is, is lying on the ground, she still preserved the, the, the crook in her knees. So it still looks like she's sitting down, but she's lying on the ground. And there's a trickle of blood that's running from her forehead on to the ground. Uh, and it's assumed by people that she's banged her head falling down. She's rushed off to the hospital. And indeed, she's dead when they get to the hospital. But as the surgeons are kind of digging in there to figure out what's, what's gone wrong with her head, and peeling back that hair with all the hairspray in it, they find out that she didn't die from a fall at all, that a, a whole bunch of black widow spiders had made their nest in her hair, okay? Uh, and that uh, they had bitten her to death, uh, and uh, that's what her problem was, okay? Any of you ever heard a version of the story? Okay, Nobody, nobody's heard a version of the story. Well, if you were a larger group, I would suspect that at least one of you had. Uh, and sometimes more of you perhaps have, hold that, uh, have, have uh, heard that story. Over to, I, I guess as many as a third of my students have heard one version or another of that story. Uh, often told about people with beehive uh, hairdos in Texas. I've heard a version told situated in Padre Island where there's a turtle woman uh, whose uh, who's, uh, hair is so messy that a turtle grows in there. Okay? But notice that the story, even after 700 years, still has a basic form where you can recognize it. You know? Uh, as the same story with different wrinkles. And the differences between the stories, using the principle in folklore studies, the more similar two things, the more significant the differences, you know. Uh, the, the differences between these stories can tell you some significant things about the medieval worldview. Uh, first of all, notice that the story that we get from 1300 is supernatural, involves God and the devil, involves prayers. Whereas the 20th century story doesn't have any of that, right? What, what is this girl killed by? She's the victim of this natural causes, the spider, right? She's also the, the victim of bad hygiene, right, you might say. So we have godliness uh, as part of the moral in the 1300 version, whereas we have cleanliness as one of the major morals in the 20th century, okay? Do you think that this story is about vanity in any way? What is this story told to illustrate? Now, I was there when this story was told, so I know what it was, what it was for in my particular case. But remember, you know, a folk story can have all kinds of variation in terms of, uh, st uh, of meaning and function. Uh, when the story was told, it was told by my parents and by older people in my community who didn't want me to hang out with these folks. Uh, it was told to signal these people as different people to set them apart to make fun of them in one way or another, okay? Uh, 
And, and the, the, the moral here was that the, these people are dirty, they have bad hygiene, you stick around with people like that, and you're going to get bit by a black widow spider, something like that, okay? So it's, it's the opposite of vanity in some ways. It's just to say that these people are dirty, unclean, so forth and so on. That doesn't mean that that's the only moral of this story uh, in the 20th century, because folklore can, can have so many meanings associated with it. But I think it's very important to note uh, that we do see a difference between the older value system and the newer value system. We learn something about medieval culture uh, and something about our own culture if we compare these two different kinds of stories. Uh, there is another story that you may have heard. I'm going to try one more on you, see how much you know, uh, uh, that uh, has to do, uh, it's been told in the 20th centuries by blacks about whites. It's been told by whites about blacks. It's been told by Mexican-Americans about African-Americans, African-Americans about Mexican-Americans, you name it, okay? But it's almost always set at a mall, okay? Uh, and there is one person of the good group, and that is the group that's telling the story, okay? Uh, uh, this woman uh, with her male child goes off to the shopping mall, okay? Uh, and the young boy needs to go to the bathroom. So she lets the boy go into the men's room, you know, and she waits for him. She waits and waits and waits and waits. He doesn't come out. Uh, so, uh, finally, she calls uh, somebody from the store or flags down a man who's walking by and saying, could you just check in on my son? Uh, and this fellow says he sees an open window. There seems to be some evidence that somebody's run away, and he finds this kid with his throat cut, a little boy with his throat cut. And then it's later found that there is a group of people running away. And these are people from the other ethnic group, the bad ethnic group, which is not one's own, not the ethnic group of the people telling the story. Okay? Uh, and as the story is sometimes developed, uh, this person is sacrificed, sometimes mutilated. Uh, and the blood from this person is used for some diabolical ritual on the part of this other group. Horrible story, right? It's been called by one of the people who studied the story a tale told too often. Okay, uh, and one of the functions of this story is, well, what would you think the, the f function of the story would be? To breed hatred. To identify a common enemy, to blame your problems on that common enemy, uh, to say this common enemy is so low that it would go after a child. Because in all the stories, going back to the Middle Ages, it's always a child victim and an adult criminal. Okay, So they seize upon the sort of emotional value of the child, and they think of, of doing something that might even be worth the death. They kill the child and then mutilate the child, and then go to the devil. I mean, you know, you can't be any worse than that. And so certainly, one of the things that it will do is foment hatred. And as much as I'm interested in folk groups, and as much as I admire folk groups, it's true among folk groups as among others that there is seldom anything more that will uh, catalyze a group, bring it together more than a common enemy. And folk culture is as much a victim of this as any other kind of culture. Okay, you find versions of this story going all the way back to the fourth century, but among the most popular versions of this particular story is a 13th century story known as the story of Hugh of Lincoln. But before I go on, had any of you heard that story or variations of that story, often known as the shopping mall murder? Okay, none of you? You're out of the legend circuit. Okay, this is often told as a, as a true story, often uh, appears in newspapers, uh, often uh, just sworn to be a fact, and often, as in these legends, happen at the mall right down the road. Okay? Uh -huh. Does it have any geographical placement? Or is it like supposedly throughout the whole country or throughout the whole world? Does it manifest itself? Well, I think legends are told where there are groups that are scared. And this particular legend, I think, gives away its points of uh, recent origin and popularity by mentioning malls. Malls change. You know, in urban centers, malls change the way that people live. Uh, in, in many communities. Uh, in Chicago, where my father was born, for example, uh, you still find parts of town where on one side of the street people speak only Polish, and the other side they speak only Lithuanian, and they do business down, down the block, and they never cross the street. Uh, they, they keep to themselves. Folk communities have, have, have often lived this way, uh, even in urban centers. But malls made it possible for people of different groups to get together, and malls often then became a focus of fears. 
a focus of fears about changing neighborhoods and focus of fears of other ethnic groups. So this tale was particularly popular throughout this country in changing neighborhoods where malls were just being introduced. Okay, that's not the only place, but that's the most common place for it. Well, in the 13th century in England, this story grew up in the city of Lincoln. Uh, and it's known as the story of Hugh of Lincoln. And it was about a little boy, this little Christian boy, uh, who had to walk home through a Jewish ghetto. At that time, as often in the history of Europe, Jews were separated from Christians, uh, and they were not allowed to own land. They could only rent. Uh, they were only allowed uh, to do certain kinds of business, one of which was charging interest on loans, which Christians weren't allowed to do. They were put in a situation where they became ready-made villains in almost any situation. Also, the Jews became the scapegoats for almost anything that might happen. For example, when the Great Plague swept Europe in 1347 to 1349, a lot of people assumed it was the Jews poisoning the water. Okay. Well, and in tough times, then, stories like this often spread to blame uh, to, to, to find a convenient villain to blame for a problem. Uh, and a story then swept through the city of Lincoln in the 13th century that this little boy, Sir Hugh, had been murdered by Jews for ritual purposes. And this ritual and pur purposes involved drinking the blood of a Christian as a sort of parody of a Christian mass, okay? Uh, as far as we know, nothing like this ever happened. We can't find Jews having parodies of Christian masses. Uh, we don't learn a lot about Jews or a lot about the other ethnic groups from legends like this. But what we do learn from these legends of the 20th century and of the 13th century is about the fears of the people who tell the stories. And it's very interesting that over time, you'll find certain things changing. For example, in all of these legends, you'll learn about the geography of fear. Okay, uh, And if uh, uh, you look closely at the medieval legends, it's always the Jewish ghetto that's a scary place. Uh, and as opposed to the mall. And often these stories circulate just before a group of people, a mob, will assemble and then go into the ghetto and burn it down. Uh, and it was uh, largely as a result of these biases and the stories that emerge from these biases, because folklore uh, serves to express the concerns, fears, and hopes of people. Um, <clears throat> largely as a result of such uh, stories that Jews were uh, exiled from England. Jews weren't allowed to live in England in the 13th century. Uh, so these stories will tell you a great deal. And the very little changes, the place where something happens, for example, between story and story will often tell you about subtle changes or big differences in the worldview of the tellers. OK, um, okay I, I wanted to mention those things uh, because um, we don't have many oral tales from peasants in the Middle Ages. How can we tell what peasant folk tales were like? We have a few traditional legends that were told by people in some very interesting circumstances that give us some kind of window on the way that peasants lived and tells, told stories. But most of these are under duress. For example, most of the folk tales that we have surviving come from Inquisition records, where people, you know, there are peasants on the stand, and they're being asked uh, to repeat what they believe, or what they've done, or what the legend of their hero might be. Uh, and when they tell these stories, uh, they are obviously not performing them under optimum circumstances, and they might be changing details so they, they don't get in any worse trouble than they're already in. But they tell us something about their worldview. Uh, one of the most interesting stories we get from the Middle Ages comes from uh, this kind of Inquisition uh, record. But first of all, this is a story that we know was shared by the highest classes and the lowest classes together. Remember, a relatively small number of people could read. There were some peasants who could read, a significant number of people in the merchant class, and about the same proportion of people in the nobility. Uh, generally, females were exposed less to writing than males, but certainly the people in the religious communities, both male and female, could write. And we have records that show that merchant women often kept the books and often could write as well. So there's a certain amount of reading and writing that's distributed among all the classes. Uh, and certainly there's more reading and writing among the upper classes than among the peasants. But everybody, in one way or another, has access to written literature. Similarly, everybody has access to oral storytelling. And even if you know how to read silently, that doesn't preclude a preference for oral entertainment. 
people tended to get their entertainment in groups. They didn't sit home in front of the TV or they didn't sit alone in front of a book and absorb it alone. Entertainment was a communal uh, enterprise in which many people shared. Uh, if that's the case, then the stories that are told are going to reflect the values not just of one author, right? But they're going to reflect the values of that entire group. The stories that stick around among the uh, merchant class might feature merchants. The stories that stick around among uh, the nobles will feature nobles. Among the ecclesiastics, ecclesiastics, the stories among the peasants will feature peasants. Okay. Um, now we have one story that comes to us from noble um, sources that is known as Llewellyn and his dog. Uh, and this has to do with a, uh, a, a Welsh king, or in some versions, a Welsh noble, and his very loyal dog that he has entrusted uh, to guard his child. He so respects the dog that he trusts it to guard his child. Now, one day, Llewellyn, in some versions, or Llewellyn's soldiers in other versions, uh, uh, comes home and uh, comes up to the bedroom of the child and the dog comes to greet the visitor and the dog's mouth is covered with blood. And it's assumed immediately by Llewellyn or his soldiers that this dog has killed the child. Uh, and in a moment of anger and panic, the soldier Llewellyn pulls a sword or takes out a spear and does away with the dog. Then Llewellyn or the soldiers walk or walks into the room and finds the baby is smiling in the crib, doing quite well, but there's a dead snake on the ground, and Llewellyn has killed this snake to save the baby's life. Okay, uh, this story, you know, which might have all kinds of morals. Don't judge by appearances. Whatever you know, moral you might take from this is told about kings. We know that nobles told this story, but we also know that a certain group of peasants in southern France told this story, and we know this from Inquisition records. In the 13th century, a small village in southern France was being investigated for heresy for its own kind of weird beliefs. And what we found uh, is that a certain inquisitor named Etienne de Bourbon, or Stephen of Bourbon, who later became a pope, actually, uh, is in there trying to find out what weird things these peasants believe. And he finds out that there is a cult of a saint greyhound, a sainted greyhound named Guinefor. OK? So we have the holy greyhound, Saint Guinefor. And there's a wonderful book on St. Guinefort by a Frenchman named Jean-Claude Schmidt. Uh, and uh, he talks about the cult of this holy greyhound. Well, these people tell the same story about this wonderful dog that saved this child's life and then was killed by accident. But their story goes on to talk about how this dog was later given a holy burial and miracles occurred where the dog was buried. And because the dog had protected this child and given its life to save a child's life, this dog was supposed to have special power over children, over babies, uh, newborns. Uh, and uh, the local wise women in this community would go out into the woods and do rituals over sick children and invoke the holy greyhound, hoping that the greyhound would cure them. We well, might say, this is altogether pagan. This is pretty wild. Obviously, there is a stratum here, or an earlier history of uh, some kind of association with nature, magical practices, perhaps na nature worship. But the people who did this didn't consider themselves to be heretics. They thought they were being good Christians, just doing what, what good Christians ought to do. And as a matter of fact, some of the records of this case show that they would take dead children out there, infants who had already died, and try to get Guinea for to revive them so that these kids could be baptized and go to heaven. So there's a, they don't see this as non-Christian at all. Uh, but isn't that an interesting way of reading this story? I mean, it can mean many things to many people. Uh, its importance among many nobles is don't judge by uh, appearances. But the importance of the story for these peasants is that dogs can save lives, and dogs might have the, 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 the magical property to save the lives of their own children. Uh, so every once in a while, and very rarely, we get some kinds of stories that give us an idea of what the lower classes live like. But I think it's important to note, even though we've talked about peasants just about exclusively in terms of folklore up to this time, that folklore involves not only the peasantry. One definition of folklore is unofficial culture. 
culture that's passed down face to face and informally. Uh, and there is no human group that we know of that doesn't have some sort of series of traditions, and storytelling, rituals, so forth and so on, that are part of an unofficial culture that is folkloric. Uh, so one thing we can do if we have enough different versions of the same story from the Middle Ages is get some idea of what kind of values were important to different groups. And each one of these different stories might tell us something about the different values of those groups. Okay? Um, folklorists recognize that there are many stories that are told so often that they might uh, be designated as international tale types. There's a certain tale of a certain type, which folklorists sometimes designate by a number, that's found all over Europe, for example, or at least uh, uh, through many different countries. And as that story changes from place to place, it will take on different shapes to replace, uh, or I'm sorry, to reflect the culture that it comes from. Uh, and each different subtype of a tale type is known by folklorists as an oikotype uh, or echotype, which, as in the root of economics, uh, means home type. As folklore goes from home to home, from uh, environment to environment, it's always going to sh change shapes to reflect uh, the aesthetics and the values of the tellers. If you think about uh, folk stories and you realize that even though they're written down once in a while, thank goodness, or we have none at all from the Middle Ages, they're most told by word of mouth. And therefore, you can't have anyone like Emily Dickinson among tellers of folktales, right? Uh, the, the teller of folktales has to be popular with the whole group, which means in some ways the whole group serves as an editor. The tale teller is not a lonely genius. The tale teller is telling a familiar story better than other people in the community, and it's a story that appeals to all of them. Because if they don't like it, that person has to shut up, and that story is not repeated anymore. Uh, folklorists have noted that the transmission of stories is really sort of a group enterprise then that involves the whole community. And you think of any uh, given tale, any given item of folklore as it's passed along, is going to have a great deal of continuity behind it. Anybody who tells a folk tale is going to tell it largely as she or he heard it from parents and relatives. Most of the story is going to be the same as before. Now, if that person is a particularly good or interested or innovative storyteller, there might be a certain amount of variation, which is the second part of the process, where that person says, well, maybe I can tell the story a little bit better. I'll add this or this or that. Or that story was told by somebody who wasn't aware of the way things are these days, so I'm going to change it to, to bring it up to date, just the way that Mardi Gras changes to be up to date, as we discussed earlier. So there's a certain amount of variation. What if the group doesn't like the variation? It gets selected out, doesn't it? So the third step here is selection. And the community then acts to preserve those variations which make the most sense, that appeal the most to the group as a whole. And then this, in turn, becomes the continuity for the next phase. So any given folk performance involves the audience, at least as much as the tale teller, in choosing how the story is going to change. Uh, therefore, in different groups, at different times, for different reasons, you're going to find the same basic folklore plot changing to suit its social environment. So in some ways, we can say that there are noble folk tales just as much as there are peasant folk tales. And this is particularly true in the Middle Ages when it seems that this broad group of people, uh, as in the case of the story of Llewellyn and his dog or St. Yenifor, a broad uh, spectrum of people shared the, the same stories that they were interested in changing each of them to reflect its own particular worldview. Uh, well, one of the books that you're assigned for uh, this course is uh, The Lays of Marie de France. Uh, and I don't know how well you remember the story of Yannick, uh, but uh, I want to tell you briefly the story of Yannick. And I have a, a, a little chart here, which I'm about to show you, uh, which contrasts the story of Yannick with a story collected in 1968 from a Mexican-American woman uh, in South Texas, a town called La Encantada, Texas. Okay? Uh, and here as we go down this, uh, you see the uh, story of Yannick uh, compared to the story of the greenish bird.
Uh, just in case you haven't read it in a while or haven't read it yet for whatever reason, I'm going to retell you basically some of the elements of the story of Yannick. Okay? Uh, and we're going to go down the left-hand column then. And then I'm going to retell uh, the version, the very interesting version that uh, you can find in Texas in the 20th century. Um, okay, first of all, the story of Yannick uh, is a poem by Marie de France. It's one of the very few poems that we can identify from the 12th century, or for that matter, elsewhere in the Middle Ages, that's written by a woman. And I think this is very important. Is there, for example, a special woman's way of telling a story, a female oikotype that expresses the concerns of women one way or another? Uh, we are not sure exactly where Marie wrote. Uh, because she is from France, we can assume she was born there. But because she says she is from France, the people she's writing for probably aren't French. Uh, you don't call yourself. Uh, I don't call myself, for example, Carl from Houston, uh, because everybody I talk to is, is from Houston. Uh, if I were, however, in Britain, I might call myself uh, Carl from Houston. And the odds on bet is that Marie de France was writing uh, in uh, Great Britain, uh, where she had come from France, but she was now perhaps uh, uh, at the court of uh, one of the kings of England. Uh, or she may have been in a, another part of Europe uh, that was not identified as France. But certainly she was a foreigner when she was writing this, or she wouldn't be identified as such. Okay, this comes from the 12th century. And the story of Yannick has to do with a young noble lady who's married to an old jealous man. Okay? Just like in the folktale of Rapunzel, this old man keeps her locked in a tower, okay, this youngish person. Um, and as she's alone there, this large hawk comes to visit her, and he turns into a handsome man, which she's quite happy about. Uh, and once, she's worried at first that uh, any bird that turns into a person might be the product of sinister magic. So she says, are you a good Christian? Uh, she wants to prove that this bird is a Christian. Uh, he says, I'll take communion. How about that? Uh, she says, OK, if you can succeed in taking communion, uh, then uh, I'm really going to pay a lot of attention to you. And once he's proved then that he's a Christian, uh, the lady uh, becomes his lover. Uh, and they have this wonderful relationship uh, that is uh, technically adulterous. But since the husband isn't all that nice, uh, you might think that this isn't such a bad thing. The story at this point, you might say, though, is pretty clearly told from a woman's point of view. And I think it's quite interesting uh, that uh, uh, the woman is definitely the good person here. The man, uh, the older man is a villain, and the woman has a fantasy lover who comes to give her a kind of a compensation fantasy for the bad life that she's uh, uh, leading here. OK. Um, OK. Uh, then. The old man's sister discovers the secret of the bird lover. Okay, uh, So the old man has his sister sort of spying on this woman. She notices that there's a bird in there uh, who turns into a person, and some funny things are going on. Okay, uh, So she gets these iron spikes and has uh, them put on the window where the bird comes in and lands on his way to visit the lady's bedside. Uh, and indeed, uh, this is exactly what happens. Okay, uh, So the uh, man then, the young knight, is um, um, mortally wounded, uh, and he's dying, and he tells the lady that she will bear a child who will avenge them by killing the old man. Okay? He then sort of limpingly flies off to his home, uh, and this woman is so distraught that she goes after him. She jumps out of the window of her tower, falls for 20 feet, and then follows this trail of blood off into the woods where she finds this uh, body that's surrounded by torches. Okay? And uh, it's in this place, then, uh, that she knows that sooner or later uh, she's going to uh, find her husband again. Okay, uh, Now, when the young lady's son is grown, this evil old husband uh, and she and the young boy travel to the tomb of this dead hawk knight. Okay? And the lady tells the son who his father really is. Okay? And she gives the night hawk's sword to the boy, and the boy uses it then to kill the husband. Okay, it's kind of a sad story. And it looks like a far out fantasy in some ways. But one of the things that folklorists say over and over again is that nobody has a fantasy about things that don't concern him or her. Everybody's fantasy is, in some ways, everybody's personal story that combines as much realism as it combines 
unbelievable aspects to tell a story that's important to that person. Uh, could this be a feminine folktale uh, reflecting the values of people in uh, uh, England or in northern France among the aristocracy? We know that Marie de France is, is writing from the aristocracy for noble patrons. Uh, could it be a, a, the folktale of uh, the women's room, you might say? Um, this whole idea of a woman kept in a tower might seem like fantasy to us, but it was a social reality in the Middle Ages. If you know the story of Eleanor of Aquitaine, the wife of Henry II, whom we talked about earlier, the man who had Thomas Becket killed, she was locked away uh, for some time in a palace. Others locked in towers uh, to make sure that they wouldn't cause any trouble. Uh, Eleanor of Aquitaine was a very strong-willed person. Henry II didn't want her to get away and cause trouble for him, as she often did in his life. Other people were locked in towers to preserve their virginity, to save them for marriages to noble people whom they didn't love, or to generally make sure that they could be surveyed and controlled by the people in power. Uh, in the Middle Ages, we have this wonderful romance literature that talks about uh, ladies on distant pedestals. But we know as well that ladies during this time were having their rights sort of taken away from them, their inheritance eroded, for example, that men and men were getting more of the lady's economic power. Okay? Uh, so could this story possibly be then part of a protest uh, uh, story, a story about what a woman would like? We could assume that a lot of noble women were not married to men that they love, that they were just there to fulfill uh, a marriage obligation that had more to do with economics and power, uh, probably, than it had to do with love. And furthermore, these women were herded uh, into certain areas. Uh, a very interesting historian named Georges Duby, uh, one of these French analysts whom we've talked about before, named Duby, has done a study of the way that nobles lived and he's found that women were largely confined. Even those who weren't in prison were largely confined. On the first floor, you find the knights sort of running around at their savage free will. Uh, and the knights uh, at night seemed to be free to do whatever they wanted to non-noble women. Poor women were regularly raped and otherwise taken advantage of by these young knights. In the second floor, or sometimes the third floor, safely guarded behind certain doors, there was a room which Duby calls the gynaceum, or the women's room. And it was in this well-protected place, high in the air, where the noblest women were kept and guarded to make sure that they were under the control of men. So could this then be a folk tale of the gynaceum? What sort of stories would women tell to each other? in the gynaceum. What would they involve? Perhaps adulterous liaisons with people who love them more than their husbands? Perhaps some being so powerful and so magical that it could penetrate into this room uh, that was otherwise walled off and uh, create a meaningful relation? Uh, uh, it's not surprising that this story is kind of tragic and it ends with the death of, uh, of, of the bird lover. But then there's a vengeance later on where the sun gets even. How many of these women lived for their sons, being denied you know, the, the love of their husband? How many of them projected their fantasies and their uh, wishes for compensation into, uh, the, uh, um, uh, into their sons? Um, OK, uh, let's look at the story of the greenish bird. Go back to this chart for a while and see how close the story is. This is a story that comes from a much different world. It comes from the poorer people uh, of uh, southern Texas. Uh, largely from people who don't read or write. The very best storytellers in the modern world are usually those who don't spend a lot of time reading or writing, even if they know how to. They tend to live in a place or in circumstances where they still prefer oral entertainment. Uh, and that includes telling stories over such things as TV and radio. So now we have the greenish uh, bird here. Uh, and notice here, instead of having a young noble lady along, alone, we have three orphan sisters. And there's one of them named Louisa who stays at home and works while the other two go out and visit bars. Okay? Uh, this is a morality tale. It might tell us how girls live. And this might be a tale that mothers tell their daughters. Or perhaps you might assume even that parents, males, tell young girls. Because here we're asking this girl to toe the line in certain ways. But let's look at the way the story develops. 
Louisa always works alone in her room, and she does a lot of sewing and embroidery. Okay? And then one, one day, a greenish bird comes to her window and sings to her that her troubles are over. And she doesn't listen because she likes to work so much, and she works so hard that she's not going to be frivolous in play. And as the story develops, and as it's told in the versions that I know of, one of the most important things is that this bird is sort of a reward for her work. Those bad girls who go out to the cantina, they might have boyfriends for a day or two, but they don't have this wonderful relationship that's about to develop here. Okay. Now, then the bird turns into a prince. What else? Uh, and he proposes to Louisa. Notice, there is no sex out of wedlock here. This is told in a society which believes that if you have marriage or have sex out of wedlock, you're doomed. Okay? That the idea of marriage is very important in this particular society, and therefore the story is going to change. Those little changes to great effect to reflect the values of the storyteller. Okay? Uh, so he proposes to Louisa, and they're married indeed, and the prince then provides for her. He, he builds her this great castle and this great garden, and he sits out there and sings to her all the time. Well, then the drunken sisters come back from the cantina, and they get pretty jealous at these developments, and they discover that the husband's a bird. They say, well, we can do something about this, so they go out and get a bunch of knives, and they put the knives on the windowsill where the bird lights to visit Louisa, uh, and indeed, uh, this works. Uh, these knives wound the bird prince, and the prince at this point says, well, I can't be with you anymore. I have to go back to my own home, but if you really love me, you can follow me to my magic land. So the prince says he has to go back, and she, the wife, Louisa, can follow if she wants. Okay. So then uh, or, or this very heroic section appears in which Louisa goes to the sun and to the moon and to the wind and to eagles and asks them where she can find this wonderful bird husband of hers. And finally, after seven years, after she has worn out a pair of iron shoes, she shows up uh, and she becomes uh, then once again the bride of uh, her beloved husband, uh, and the two live happily ever after. Uh -huh. It sounds like that version has as much in common with the story of Cupid and Psyche as uh -huh. it does with Yannick, the idea of, of the sisters being jealous of mm -hmm. this fabulous marriage. Okay, or well you might as well think of the story of Beauty and the Beast, which is also related uh, to Cupid and Psyche, that both of those stories, Cupid and Psyche and um, uh, Beauty and the Beast, are very closely related to this tale. And yet these two are even more closely related. If we, if we look over time, we'll find almost all the folk versions show happiness prevailing, okay, uh, and the woman going on this great journey. Uh, as far back as we can trace them, one reason why I think that Yannick is a particular oikotype that's conditioned by people who have a pretty tragic view of life. Marriage isn't a solution for these people. Getting hooked up with the husband isn't a solution for these people, right? Because they are indeed in prison in marriages that are not of their own choice. But having a fantasy lover and having some sort of vengeance, uh, uh, fantasy vengeance on that lover, uh, I mean, the ve fantasy vengeance on the husband, is something that might come closer to their experience. Uh, so I would agree with you that this story is close to Cupid and Psyche, but it's representative of the oral tale. Uh, whereas Mary, Marie de France's looks a little bit different. I would say that in some ways it represents the folklore then of the gynaceum, that it's an upper class, noble woman's uh, fantasy about the way life might work out uh, a little bit better uh, in the 12th century. Good question. Um, okay, there, there are quite a few more of these tales that can tell us some, some really interesting things about the folk in the Middle Ages. And some of the very best of these tales come to us from the strangest sources. They're written often by church people, and they often occur in penitential manuals, or as in the story of the spider in the hairdo, they, be, they uh, come to us as parts of a, um, um, uh, uh, a, a number of sermon stories, stories that are told by clerics, but are told to sort of uh, enhance the lifestyles of, uh, of uh, lay people. Okay? And I want, want to just tell you a few stories, give you some idea of the kind of medieval stuff you can, uh, can get that comes from the folk. Uh, and these stories come from a work by Robert Manning known as Handling Sin. And you see this written uh, on your screen right now. Uh, this man was a Gilbertine monk who lived in Lincolnshire uh, at a town uh, called Burn. 
uh, and he wrote a work called Handling Sin, uh, which uh, means concerning sin or hands-on sin. Manual of Sin is probably the best translation here. Uh, and it's one of our best uh, opportunities to see how things might differ a little bit from class to class in the Middle Ages. Because what Robert Manning is doing here is taking an upper class penitential manual that's written in French. And it's written in French for people who can read alone and aristocrats and noble people, okay, and for noble people within the monastery themselves, the upper class of the monastery. Robert Manning translates this into English, and he says specifically, I got these stories from this other manual, but I want to tell them in English for lewd people, lower class people, okay, people who don't have letters. And he says, furthermore, I know that lewd people, these lower class people, um, love stories. And they can go out and when they drink ale, they'll tell each other stories that encourage sin. Or when they're playing their summer games, when they're out there doing their competitions in the fields, they tell each other stories. They tell each other stories at night. It's a wonderful example of the context of some medieval storytelling that otherwise we wouldn't have. He says, I'm going to tell stories, the kind of stories that these people like. But instead of being the stories they tell that encourage sin, these are going to be stories that get them uh, to, uh, uh, to pay more attention to what they ought to be paying attention to, make them a little bit more holy. So Robert Manning tells a number of stories in his version that aren't in the French original. And some of these we can assume he got right out of the mouths of the folk in the local area. Uh, and some of these things are interesting because the stories themselves are so good. They give us such a wonderful image of what peasant life is like that they're not necessarily that adaptable to the morals that he says they should be for in the first place. He tells a beautiful story about the witch, the bag, and the bishop. This is about a witch and this magic bag that she makes out of leather, a belly of leather that she makes. Uh, and she and, uh, pronounces incantations over that leather bag. And then it flies through the air, and it goes through the countryside, and then it sucks the udders of cows to get milk out of the cows and brings the milk back to the witch. Okay? Now, this is a folk belief that we know has prevailed for years and years and years. Uh, and people's folk beliefs will often reflect their basic social background. You think of the witches that are presented to us in the Renaissance, the witches that are supposed to have made a pact with the devil. And these witches have all the powers in the world, according to the inquisitors. And yet, what do they do? They suck their neighbor's cows dry. Don't you think we might be talking about two different witches here? There's the witch of the ecclesiastics, the witch of the, uh, the church people, who's this confederate with Satan. Okay, But among the poor people who are living in that subsistence economy where nature and society have to be in sync all the time, the witch is the one who makes my cow dro go dry. That's a catastrophe if you're a poor person. But you can pretty much tell that this kind of belief comes out you know, from the farming population, from the poorer people around. Well, as this story progresses, Robert Manning says, uh, the neighbors get quite upset. And finally, they discover that there is a witch who is indeed making this belly of uh, leather suck cow's udders. Uh, so they bring this witch to the bishop. And the bishop says, well, I want to see this bag of leather. Uh, and I want to see you make the cows uh, lose their milk. So the witch says, OK. Uh, and she pronounces her in incantations over this bag of leather. And then it flies out, and it sucks the milk out of the cows, comes back, does exactly what it's told to do. Bishop says, this is something. I want you to teach me how to do this. Okay, uh, And uh, so he gets all the words down. He's got someone there to write the words down. And he pronounces his incantation, Okay, says all the right words at the right time, and the bag doesn't move. Okay, And the witch says, well, you've got the letter down, right? But the spirit isn't there. Belief is everything. You have to believe this for this to work. No, the bishop says, I'm never going to believe that. That's evil. Uh, and then he uh, tells the witch, I forbid you to believe it either. Okay. And then Robert Manning ends his story okay, by saying, essentially, that belief is everything. You better be careful of what you believe. Okay. Now, this is a very interesting story, especially when we can uh, compare it uh, to the other stories told at the time um, uh, and some of the philosophy of the time. 
For example, although these things varied widely in certain places and certain times, the general church position in the 14th century, at the beginning of the 14th century, around 1303, when Robert Manning was writing down his Handling Sin book, the general church position was that it was heresy to believe that people had magical powers. Okay? It's not in the Bible. It's not part of Christian doctrine, according to the medieval people. Therefore, it doesn't exist. It's heresy to believe that witches really exist. Now, that's 1303. By the time we get to the middle, uh, or the end of the Middle Ages, in the beginning of the Renaissance, 1485, uh, the church has decided that witches do exist. And they become witches through their confederacy with Satan. And it's heresy not to believe that witches have these powers. Okay? It's interesting, uh, in Robert Manning's case, dealing with folk culture, that belief is everything. You believe it or you don't. If you believe it, it'll work for you. Okay? But what Robert Mar Manning asked the people who were listening to him is, what would you rather believe? Are you going to believe uh, uh, the, the point of view of a witch and just get a little more milk? Or are you going to believe the Christian point of view and save your mortal soul? Okay? He's speaking to a particular belief system, and therefore he tells us something about peasant belief. Uh, so in summary, I'd like to tell you a lot more stories, but there isn't time here. Uh, there are quite a few stories, even from the writing done by some high church officials that can allow us a window into the people of the Middle Ages. Again, these people are the foundation of folk culture. They might be 90% of the people uh, in the Middle Ages. And these are the people I think we have to pay more attention to if we're going to understand what the entire Middle Ages is all about. Do uh, you have any... Uh, Final questions or comments on that? Well, thanks for coming by.